the light bulb moment. So if you're expecting me to come here and tell you the neurobiology of the light bulb moment, then you'll be disappointed and you can leave now. Understanding the light bulb moment is one of the mysteries of neuroscience. We don't have the answers and it makes it an extraordinarily exciting area to work in. What I will tell you about are three revolutions which will transform your lives and the lives of everyone in the 21st century. I have here three quotes from Albert Einstein, one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. My favourite one is the final quote. The most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and all science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe, is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. You can see from the first quote that even for a genius, light bulb moments don't come easily. So the brain is a mind machine. I use this term, used in a book by that name by Colin Blakemore a couple of decades ago. There's 100 billion neurons connected by 1,000 trillion synapses, the connections between them. So the most powerful supercomputers in the world don't have light bulb moments. It's this kilogram and a half of soft tissue in your skulls that facilitates everything you feel, everything you think, and everything you do. So the first revolution I'll tell you about is the revolution of neuroplasticity. So until a couple of decades ago, we thought the adult brain was fixed. It was a machine, it was like a computer. So this revolution involves understanding how your experience, how the environment sculpts your brain, not just in childhood, but in adulthood. It changes the connections between neurons. It can even cause the birth of new neurons in your adult brain. And hopefully, if you do remember anything from this talk, that will have left a structural and a functional change in your brain that allows you to remember it and maybe helps you generate your own light bulb moment. Here's a type of brain plasticity that you can all understand, that of learning and memory. Neurons that wire together, fire together. So it's the connections between them that are important. So the brain is unique in another way. It's the only organ in the body that never stops developing. You can see here images developed from MRI brain scans in healthy individuals from the age of 5 through to 20. If you look at the bottom left, what you see there is a change in the brain. In childhood, you have extra connections and you have more grey matter in the cerebral cortex. And your experience over this period, in fact, throughout your life, sculpts your brain, which is what is shown there in the changing that occurs in the thickness of the grey matter during this period. On the bottom right is the brain shown from the right side. So we're not just doing this for curiosity. At the Florey Institute, we're looking at a range of brain and mind disorders. And so I've shown here just some of the brain and mind disorders and other neurological disorders that we work on. So I want a show of hands. So could everyone in the audience who's been personally affected, who's had a family member or a friend affected by one or more of these brain disorders, could you raise your hand? Well, that's extraordinary, but expected. So my dear aunt died a few months ago after suffering horribly from Alzheimer's disease. And she had a very bright mind, so it was absolutely shocking to see it completely dimmed by dementia. And so it's often that we only understand the power of the human brain when we see it destroyed by brain disease. So here's some numbers for you. You can see 
1.5 billion and rising people affected worldwide by brain and mind disorders. And you see there that 75% of the population will suffer from at least one brain disorder in their lifetime. So we hear almost every day that our country is facing another crisis. So the question is, what can be more important than learning how to prevent, to treat and eventually cure these and other diseases of the brain and the body? So on to the second revolution. This is the revolution of genomics. So we're rapidly reaching the point where the three billion base pairs of DNA in your genome, in every cell in your body, can be sequenced for less than a few hundred dollars per person. This will mean that you will carry your genome, probably on a credit card sized device, that you will hand it to your GP and other healthcare professionals and clinicians, and this will dictate the way in which personalised and precision medicine is delivered to you, providing our healthcare systems can support that new technology. But it will change your lives. So back to brain and mind disorders. Each one of them is caused by a combination of genetic and environmental factors. You can see some of these major brain disorders listed here. So there's a lot of focus on genomics, the study of the genome of all individuals, those who are healthy, those with particular diseases. However, I would suggest that in parallel what we need is a field of enviromics, where we gather data on individuals, which needs to go from conception through to old age, quantitative data, hard data on large populations, which is what's happening with genomics at the moment. And we need to put those two together. That's the level of information we need to understand the cause of these very complex brain disorders and to use that information to develop new treatments. All right, here's a little slide here for the geneticists in the audience. I assume there are none. So in order to understand a disease, we need a good model. And to do that, we need to sort the sheep from the goats. I'm going to tell you now about a light bulb moment that I had. So we were studying a mouse model of Huntington's disease. And at the time, in the 1990s, it was considered the epitome of genetic determinism. 100% genetic, it's a fatal brain disease, inherited by half the children when one of the parents has Huntington's disease. So I wanted to challenge the dogma, and with a graduate student, Anton Van Dellen, what we did was divide the mice up into those that received standard housing conditions, were a little bit boring, and those conditions in which there was increased cognitive stimulation and increased physical activity. And what we found in this experiment was quite striking. You can see here a measure in this graph of Huntington's disease, the symptoms going up with standard housing to 100% in this adult mouse model of Huntington's disease. What we found, if you see in the bottom of the graph, with environmental enrichment, there was a dramatic delay in onset and progression of Huntington's disease due to this increased cognitive stimulation and physical activity. So how might this happen? One of the ways we think this might happen is at the level of neuroplasticity of individual cells. So neurons are the most extraordinary cells in the body. A single neuron can receive thousands of connections or synapses from other neurons. And it's this complexity that allows the brain to process enormous amounts of information, but it also allows for an enorm enormous amount of neuroplasticity. So you can see an example here whereby the environmental enrichment leads to the creation of new connections, new synapses, and this may be the way in which it can actually be therapeutic with respect to these kind of brain diseases. So on to the third revolution. This is the revolution of epigenetics. So what this refers to, you can see the beautiful double helical strand of DNA that has molecules attached to it. So it refers to chemical modification of DNA. Essentially, it's above the genome without 
changing the letters of DNA. So what you're seeing here is an epigenetic landscape. This term comes back to Conrad Waddington and the first description of epigenetics. So imagine on this epigenetic landscape that the rolling stone is brain development. And this is partly dictated by the genetics, which dictates the trajectory of brain development along particular pathways. The rest of this pathway is dictated by the environment and experience. And it can shift development in different ways. Now, what we know is that genomes evolve over thousands of years. So essentially, you have the genome and the brain and the body that's very similar to that of our hunter-gatherer ancestors. So if any particular disease, including brain disorders, is changing in incidence or prevalence, the implication is not that the genome is changing. It's that there are changes in the environment which perhaps our, our genomes and our brains and our bodies are maladapted to. This may have relevance to disorders of brain development, for example, autism and schizophrenia. Another implication of this epigenetics and neuroplasticity is the concept of brain reserve. So brain reserve may be most relevant to disorders such as Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. What occurs here is that this increased cognitive stimulation and physical activity builds a neuroprotective reserve within the brain. Now, the concept is that if we can understand how this cognitive stimulation physical activity is protective and beneficial at the level of molecules and the level of cells, then we could develop environmentics. These would be new therapeutics which mimic or enhance the beneficial effects of this cognitive simulation and physical exercise. So finally, we're all dealt a genetic deck of cards at conception that we can do nothing about. Many of us, due to our genomes and our genetic predisposition, start to move down the red pathway towards a particular brain disorder. However, thanks to neuroplasticity and brain reserve, this pathway can be shifted towards the left, the green pathway, which is the pathway that we all want to be on. So this would be the pathway where we have healthy brain maturation, brain function, and aging, so that these light bulb moments can continue throughout life. Thank you.